Flight Management and Flight Deck Management Aircraft captaincy involves the management of the aircraft, its crew, and the supporting company infrastructure, in a changing ambient environment, to achieve the highest levels of safety, comfort, and efficiency The aim of the captain therefore is to achieve safe, comfortable and efficient operations. This he cannot do alone, he must delegate tasks as appropriate to crew members and others and ensure prompt and accurate compliance. The captain holds the final responsibility for the operation of the aircraft. However, all crew members must assist the captain in decision-making and obtaining information on which decisions may be made. The captain must allow other crew members to question his decisions. Previously we saw how incomplete or poor communication can hamper good decision-making. It therefore follows that no one, least of all the captain, is infallible. Making correct decisions is only part of the story, making them at the correct time so that they can be implemented without adverse impact on other tasks and prioritizing the resultant workload are of paramount importance in flight deck management. A well-managed flight deck should appear to be a calm and well-ordered place, busy at peak periods certainly, but never frantic and definitely never degenerating to the point where one or both pilots are overloaded. In the former well-ordered arena, the pilots will have enough spare capacity to accept unexpected additional tasks without undue distraction from that primary task, flight path control. In the latter chaotic state, one extra task may be sufficient to distract one or both pilots for long enough for an irrecoverable situation to develop. Consideration needs to be given to other aspects of the progress of the flight. This involves communicating with cabin crew, a two-way process, and also passengers, albeit not at the expense of primary tasks. The parallel operation of the cabin in concert with the physical progress of the airplane through the sky is an important part of any airline's success. The passengers pay for it all. Flight Deck Workload Management It is self-evident that avoidance of accidents should be the priority of all who work in our industry. Also, it should be the primary task of the crew, and thus the captain, to plan their work in such a manner as to avoid inducing an accident and to permit themselves to deal with unforeseen events which may otherwise lead to an accident. A cautionary tale for the unwary pilot error is one of the great misused and misunderstood phrases of the industry. CRM training will have shown you most convincingly that incidents and accidents are the result of multiple causal factors. However, it will suffice if we simplify and accept for this section of the course that we treat pilot error as an error or oversight of a crew member that causes an incident or accident, even if it is the final link in the chain. Sadly, pilot error continues to be a major cause of accidents to perfectly serviceable or at any rate flyable airplanes. Some 80% of all Western built hull loss accidents are attributable to avoidable human factors. The error may be just that, a single simple error of judgment or skill. More usually, it is the culmination of a chain of minor errors and omissions on its own each of these may be insignificant, but when allied to others in the chain they create a situation that is irrecoverable. Clearly, such a situation can be injurious to your career as well as your longevity. A well-ordered flight deck where forward planning, workload management, SOPs and teamwork reign supreme is unlikely to become the scene of crime as far as multiple errors and omissions are concerned. The calls and cross-checks that are an integral part of our SOPs will help to ensure this. An undisciplined and chaotic flight deck where an artificially high peak workload is created and non-standard procedures are the norm is the breeding ground for a situation to develop which the crew no longer has the capacity to recognize or deal with. It is well known and documented that most accidents occur to airplanes during phases of flight that take them close to or on the ground. During these phases of flight the airplane is operated at the very lower end of its fight envelope and undergoes considerable acceleration to its en route climb speed, or deceleration from descent to approach speed. Also it undergoes the transformation from a wheeled to a winged vehicle, and vice versa, during takeoff and landing. This alone creates a higher workload for the crew than a stable phase of flight, for example, cruise. Inevitably the takeoff and landing involve passing through the most hazardous layer of the atmosphere. The layer nearest the ground contains a greater concentration of hazards than any other for example terrain, turbulence, wind shear, precipitation, icing, birds, and other airplanes. It is also the busiest time for both pilots flying a SID or STAR often with noise abatement considerations, increased frequency of radar or tower calls and changes to frequencies and clearances, checklists to read, altimeters to set and check, radio aids to identify, reconfiguring the airplane, flaps, gear, speed brakes, operating AI systems, maneuvering onto final approach etc. Clearly the collective wits of the crew need to be available to deal with this and still be able to cope with the unexpected. A superior pilot is one who uses his superior judgment to avoid situations that require him to demonstrate his superior skill. 75% of hull losses for less than 20% of the average flight time. 
Some more statistics. A strong and interesting correlation exists between accidents, as detailed above, and incidents reported. An exact comparison is difficult bearing in mind that the reporting categories are slightly different and that the above figures relate to hull loss rates, not just damaged aircraft. Nonetheless, the overall similarity is remarkable. High workload phases of flight are the most vulnerable to both accidents and incidents. Almost one half, 50%, of the reported incidents that occurred in the descent approach and landing phase were in part attributed to communication failure, not radio failure, with ATC. Over a third, 33%, was attributable in part to communications failures on the flight deck. Consider when and if you use the cockpit speaker and hand mic rather than the headset. Some lessons to be learned. Workload, prioritize tasks and plan your routine workload to keep as much as possible away from operating peak periods. Avoid distractions, ATC chat cabin crew requests talkative crew on the jump seat. The sterile flight deck procedure below flight level 100, 10,000 feet is there for a reason, do not abuse it. Flight deck discipline, be professional, insist on SOPs. Destabilized approaches, know the criteria, anticipate, do not be tempted to continue with it, go around, discontinue the approach or better still avoid the situation by better planning. Preparation, are you sure that the airplane is prepared for takeoff or landing? Terrain, vertical awareness, know where the ground and obstacles are all the time. Direct routings, be airspace aware, what category airspace are you being sent into, what level of ATC service can you expect, be vertically aware, have charts available, it's the only way to obtain that information. Icing, take great care in icing conditions, be very particular about the icing and anti-icing procedures. All of these items come under the banner of airmanship. The first two are perhaps less tangible than the rest but are nonetheless vital to proper management of the flight deck environment and safe flight progress. It is not possible to write a procedure or a checklist to regulate workload planning or eliminate distractions. A thoughtful and professional approach to the problem is required and evidently, experience also helps. Task prioritization and workload planning will help toward the goal of a safe operation. Clearly, such careful and organized planning of workload will improve the flow and overall tone of the flight deck. In itself, this will not prevent some unforeseen catastrophe from befalling you, but it will leave you in a far better position to cope with it and prevent you from becoming a statistic. Task Prioritization Some Simplified Guidelines Aviate, Navigate, Communicate, Manage In other words, Prioritize A much simplified model of task prioritization using three levels of task. 1. Flight Path Control, Flying the Aircraft, Monitoring PF 2. Systems Operation calling for engine anti-ice, select and monitor ang anti-ice. 3. Ancillary tasks, passenger PA, completing flight report. A lower grade task should not interfere with a higher one. Be aware of the risks involved in accepting additional inappropriate tasks, especially at peak workload times. It should be noted that, for example, when PNF takes over handling duties from PF whilst PF sets up the FMGC for approach, PNF is now responsible for flight path control and must not allow anything else to distract from that. Any ancillary tasks must be placed on hold. This, unfortunately, is often disregarded and should be emphasized. Do not overload PNF with extra tasks, particularly at peak times, for example, Asking the FO to calculate the diversion fuel whilst attempting to intercept the ILS is clearly a bad idea and also contrary to SOP. Some more examples of inappropriate task prioritization. Making a routine passenger address to passengers while starting engines during pushback, should be concentrating on engine start and monitoring. Passenger addresses or company calls on the final approach. Remember, PF flight path control. PNF monitoring. PF actions and flight path control. PNF completing OFP at low altitude. PNF should be head up monitoring flight path and maintaining lookout. Approach brief after top of descent. Unless late runway change or diversion, too much distraction from flight path control and lookout for both pilots. As captain, you must be prepared to prioritize tasks for both pilots regardless of who is PF. Planning. Experience dictates that the best run flight decks are those where there are few surprises. Anticipation or forward planning will have removed the element of surprise by considering options before a decision is required. By doing this the workload has been transferred to the off-peak areas. And due and correct consideration has been given to all the factors involved.
An optimum solution to the problem can now be deduced. Keep ahead of the game. Should you find yourself, or your FO being surprised by a particular circumstance, or should you find yourself with a very high workload, particularly towards the end of a flight, ask yourself. Why? What did you as a crew miss? Could you have done it better? And finally, the content of the sections thus far is not meant to overwhelm you with the gravity of the position of the aircraft commander but should have given you a flavor of the level of responsibility. Commercial flying is not inherently dangerous but the sky can be a particularly unforgiving place to be. Wilbur Wright said in 1908, for flying to be completely safe you must sit on the fence and watch the birds. Not a practical proposition for pilots. It does mean that an aircraft captain must strive to always be vigilant and work to improve standards and never allow experience to pave the way to complacency. Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem where the machines talk to their operators. We can pull and haul and push and lift and drive. We can print and plow and weave and heat and light. We can run and race and swim and fly and drive. We can see and hear and count and read and write. But remember, please, the law by which we live. We are not built to comprehend a lie. We can neither love nor pity nor forgive. If you make a slip in handling us you die. So remember the five Ps, prior planning prevents poor performance.